Amen. So give it away. Leadership in the life of Jesus. We're looking at how, was, how did Jesus lead? What did he do? How did he do it? Uh, how did he help those around him to lead themselves? And how can he help every single one of us to become better leaders? Because the New Testament is really clear. Jesus has passed the baton on to us. In John's biography of Jesus, chapter 14, verse 12, this is what he says. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. You will do, you and I, we will do even greater things than the works of Jesus, because he is going to the Father and sending his Spirit to equip us. And that includes leadership. And so over these four weeks, we're going to be looking at the four stages of leadership, the ways in which leaders can help others to grow as disciples, and how their leadership needs to change as those disciples grow in maturity. So we have, we've called it really simple. Uh, I do, you watch. I do, you help. You do, I help. You do, I watch. Straightforward. And we'll see how Jesus puts that developmental kind of leadership program into practice throughout his ministry. And tonight, we're starting with that first stage of leadership, I do, you watch. And we're going to look at uh, three things, really simply. What, we're going to look at leaders. What does it mean to be a leader in the first place? Key question for us to ask. Apprentices, what does it mean to, to grow as uh, disciples and followers of Jesus, but also as leaders? And thirdly, followers, the first lesson of leadership in the life of Jesus. So let's start with that first one, leaders. What does it mean to be a leader? How are we going to define it? As we set off on this journey together, what do we mean when we talk about leadership? Well, it's, it's actually it's a hot topic. Uh, the business world, for the last 20 years, has invested loads of time and energy and thought into leadership rather than management. So if you want to see a successful company, you want a company full of leaders, not just managers. The church, always a few years behind, is playing catch-up. And uh, increasingly, I'm on a leadership program uh, in the Church of England at the moment. It's the first one of its kind. Uh, and it, Right at the beginning of that program, uh, uh, the, the speaker had to begin by saying, well, this is what we mean when we're talking about leadership, because it, in the church, it's controversial. Clergy don't like always talking about leadership. They're nervous about some of the connotations of leadership. So it's a hot topic. So how are we going to define leadership here at St. Paul's? Well, Rick's mentioned some of it this morning. Uh, it's relational, not organizational. When we're talking about leadership here, we're not talking about status or position. We're talking about relationships, the people, the relationships with the people around you. And more than that, we're talking about influence. Essentially, in its broadest in broadest terms, leadership is influence. Being a leader means influencing others. Simon Walker, a leadership guru, uh, that uh, talks about uh, the leader being someone who takes someone from somewhere to somewhere else. He takes them on a journey from here to there. There's a goal. They say, right, we are, this is where we are. We are going to go over there. From a familiar place that feels safe and secure to, an, to the unknown, there's movement of the follower from where they are to where they one day will be. And the leader is the one that makes that journey possible. It's the leader who has the vision to say, this is where we are, but we could be over there. Shall we set that goal and make that happen? And the follower doesn't know what the future will hold. But the follower knows the leader. And so the follower trusts the leader and begins to move towards the goal. When those things are all in place, when there is a goal, when there is a vision for, to achieve that goal, when there's the trust of the leader, 
you begin to see the movement of the followers and a healthy exercise of power takes place. And in this passage, we see Jesus set the goal, gives the vision. I will send you out, he says, to fish for people. So come, follow me. Robert Townsend uh, defines a leader in this way. He says, a leader is a person with a magnet in his heart and a compass in his head. He has a magnet in his heart. People are drawn to him. They trust a leader and a compass in his head. He has a, a goal, a vision. She knows where she's going. Now you might be sitting there thinking, that's really interesting, Rod. That applies to the person next to me who I know is a leader, but I am not a leader. And that's true, isn't it? Very often we don't see ourselves as leaders. We're happy to follow others who we regard as leaders. We uh, say, you know, we are offered the responsibility of making decisions and we say, no thanks, I'm happy to Give that responsibility to someone else. But the truth is that all of us influence others. If you're a parent, you influence your children. If you're a teacher, you influence your students. If you're an employer, you influence your employees. If you manage a team, you influence your team members. If you're older, you influence younger people. If you have friends, which I suspect most of you do, you will influence your friends. Mike Breen, who's an, another uh, leadership guru, he said this, we all look like sheep from the front, but shepherds from the back. In other words, someone is looking to you to lead, and you are looking to someone to lead you. We all look like sheep from the front, but shepherds from the back. We are all leaders, whether you realize that or not, or whether you like that or not. And the truth is, you can do it. You can unlock your leadership potential. Because leadership is a skill that everyone can learn. There was a hugely influential book uh, 20 years ago, I think it is now or so so ago, called uh, Emotional Intelligence by a guy called Daniel Goleman. He has shaped how we understand intelligence uh, in in Western thought, really. Uh, But he wrote uh, another book called Primal Leadership. And uh, which was engaging with this idea of emotional intelligence. And he says this, he says, the challenge of mastering leadership is a skill like any other, such as improving your golf game or learning to play slide guitar. He's an American. Uh, Anyone who has the will and motivation can get better at leading once he understands the steps. And the first step towards becoming a leader like Jesus is to adopt a particular posture. What one uh, writer, Robert Quinn, in his book, Building the Bridge as You Walk on It, which I think is one of my favorite titles for any leadership book, uh, describes as the fundamental state of leadership. He contrasts that with our normal kind of state, our normal posture, if you like. And he says, most of the time, we are self-focused. We have as our focus our interests and our own needs. He says we are also externally focused, so when we look at those around us, the thing we're most concerned about tends to be our reputation. How do those around us see us? And he says, and internally, we are closed. We, are, uh, we want security. We are happy in our comfort zones, and we tend not to naturally go beyond that. And lastly, he says, we're comfort-centered, so we're quite reactive. We, we've, we settle into a pattern that we enjoy, that we're happy with, and only if something breaks into that do we have to respond to it. That, he says, is our natural state. And, and he says, to remain in this, this normal state, refusing to change while the universe changes around us, is ultimately to choose slow death. And so he challenges every one of us. He says, if you want to live life to the full, 
Learn to lead. Adopt this fundamental state of leadership, this posture. And he describes the posture in this way. He says, it's not self-focused, interested only in my own needs and interests. It's other-focused. My primary focus is the common good. I'm not externally focused. I worry about what others think about me and my reputation. I'm internally uh, directed. So I am... My decisions are shaped by my values. I'm not internally closed, just happy in my comfort zone, but I'm externally open. Not only am I willing to step outside my comfort zone, I delight in the joy of discovery, of exploration, of trying new things. And he says, lastly, we're not comfort-centered, just reacting to those things that break into this wonderful, safe world we have created for ourselves. We are purpose-centered. We know what we're about. We have a vision for our lives. We have a goal, a purpose. So we are proactive. We make things happen. How do we move from this normal state of existence, which is a slow death for every one of us, to this fundamental state of leadership? How do we get from here to there? Well, that's what we hope this series will help us to explore a little bit. And you might think to yourself, goodness me, that sounds like a mighty amount of effort. Can I be bothered? Do I want to go on this journey from here, which feels great? My needs are met. My reputation's good. I feel comfortable. I manage to deflect most of those things that break into my life. Why would I want to go over here, which feels so much more risky? Well, it's because your leadership matters. Your leadership really matters. What I've found in, in all of the uh, kind of uh, reading that I've done or the thinking that we've done together or whatever it is, we see that you can, you can tweak things here in an organization. You can try new things and do things in different ways. But the only um, guarantee of growth and success will be the quality of your leader's. You can come up with whatever name you like for a connect group. You can define it in any way. Uh, you can suggest any model. But if the, the, there's not a, the right leader in place, it won't flourish and thrive. And so your leadership is key to the spiritual health of this church. And yes, that particularly matters if you're a connect group leader or a small group leader or a team leader. But you might not be yet. You might be only a potential leader. Well, nothing happens without you. Leaders. Secondly, apprentices. Every leader learns in our uh, booklet, which I realize I haven't got with me, our Making Disciple Makers booklet that we've been looking at for the last few weeks. The last two questions are for leaders. And... Uh, the, 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 um, the fifth question is all about learning. What are you learning at the moment? And it asks three things. What are you reading? What skills are you learning? And what experiences have you learned from? It recognizes that leaders are, are learners. And they go through these, this, these phases of growth. Because first and foremost, every leader is a disciple. And so what you see in this passage are, are a group of disciples that are enthusiastic. They've been called of Jesus. They're feeling honored by that call, but they are incompetent. They have no idea what they're getting themselves into. And then you see, as they begin to grow, things go wrong. And they begin to realize that they're incompetent and their enthusiasm wanes. Yet they're still incompetent. But slowly but surely, over the time, as the leader invests in the disciple, they begin to grow in confidence until they become confident and competent too. And the Bible's really clear that that sort of growth for a disciple, it's normal. That sort of movement and development, it's normal. If we are not experiencing that sort of development in our lives, we're stagnating. We're, we're just treading water, waiting to sink. And leaders, 
lead disciples through this process of growth and development and change. And leaders, therefore, need to adapt to reflect where it is that those they're leading find themselves. And so the different uh, tech. Uh, Techniques, I suppose, that we're talking about in these uh, four weeks are around direction and coaching, collaboration, and eventually delegation. But what we see in this passage, right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, is that the disciples, they are enthusiastic, but they are incompetent. Yes, they, they're pleased that Jesus has, has picked them out as ordinary fishermen. A rabbi has just chosen them. They can't believe their good fortune. But really, they are naive, they're idealistic. And do you notice what, how Jesus approaches them in that state? He's direct. He's not consensual. He says, repent and believe, the kingdom of God is near, come follow me. He is assertive, he doesn't look for consensus and agreement, he's confident in his proclamation. He says, take it or leave it. His vision is clear because he knows that at this stage trying to develop something by consensus will merely dilute the vision. Marcus Buckingham, uh, probably my favorite leadership guru, uh, in, in his book The One Thing You Need to Know says this of clarity. He says effective leaders don't have to be passionate, they don't have to be charming, they don't have to be brilliant, they don't have to possess the common touch, they don't have to be great speakers. What they must be is clear. Show us clearly whom we should seek to serve. Show us where our core strength lies. Show us which score we should focus on and which actions must be taken today and we will reward you by working our hearts out to make our better future come true. What they must be is clear. And here, Jesus is incredibly clear. There is no discussion. There is no debate. And they do as they're told. I don't know my uh, daughter, Amelia's three, turning three, and uh, I used to find it really difficult when my dad said to me, I used to ask him the question, why, dad? And he said, because I told you so. And, uh, and I'm coming to that place where I realize that sometimes that's appropriate. I was probably 17 when my dad was still saying that to me. Um, in fact, he might still say that to me now. But um, Amelia at three, when she says, why, daddy, why, why, why? There are so many reasons that she can't possibly understand why a decision has been made. And I have to simply say to her, because I've said so, this is how it is and that's the stage, in a sense, that the disciples are at, right at the beginning, when they are enthusiastic but incompetent. It's like riding a bike. You don't um, uh, just say, how, how would you like to do it? You give clear instructions. This is how it, you will not fall over <laughs> as you begin to ride your bike. So Jesus sets the direction of travel. He is direct, but he is also available. So he is a, an example to follow. So he models his instructions. So when he is clear, they know what that entails. He sets their expectations. He, accept, ex, um, he kind of exemplifies their behaviors. And so what you see in the whole first half of Mark is a huge amount of I do, you watch, then we talk. And so Jesus engages in this kind of rapid succession of healings, of exorcism, of preaching. The disciples do none of it. They just watch what he does. And there's very little explanation, but there is constant observation. So much so that when uh, the, um, the, the, the Pharisees saw the change that had taken place in the disciples, they thought, hang on, they have been with Jesus So Jesus does, and they watch, and then they reflect on it. So leaders, apprentices, always learning. Thirdly, followers. Now, I don't know how you responded to me saying, well, actually, look, in this first phase of leadership, Jesus is direct. He's not consensual. He sets a vision, he's clear, and says, take it or leave it, come follow me. 
Maybe you felt a little nervous about that, a little anxious. Because I think that reflects our culture. Our culture is nervous about that sort of direct leadership. We don't like being told what to do. We're nervous of authority. We have seen too many tyrants. We don't want another one. How do we avoid that? Well, it's remembering that we, as followers of Jesus, follow a particular leader. Christian leadership is distinctive. Christian leadership looks like Jesus. And so before we are leaders, first and foremost, we have to be followers. And that means leading like Jesus. And Jesus describes himself as the good shepherd. He says, I'm not like a hired hand that's in it for the money, in it for the kudos, for the reputation, the prestige, or the pay. No, I, am, I love my sheep. I'm passionate about my sheep, so much so that I will lay down my life for my sheep. I will live a life of sacrifice and love for those that I lead. So later on in Mark's gospel, Jesus contrasts the leadership he expects of his disciples with the leadership that they saw around them from the Romans. And this is what he says. Jesus called them together and said, in Mark 10, 42, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. See, Christian leadership is servant leadership. Jesus washes his disciples' feet. He models for them humility and dependence on God. That doesn't mean at any point that he can't be direct or clear. But he knows where his power and his authority, where his leadership comes from, what it's rooted in. That's why we're calling this series, Give It Away. Because actually our leadership has to begin with a recognition that we have received something ourselves. That we have received from God. As leaders, when we exercise power, for that is what leadership is, we need to recognize where it comes from. We need to recognize that we are dependent on God. And that should bring us humility. I... Um, I remember going to a fairly traditional Anglican service. I've done this a few times, and um, sometimes at the cathedral. And uh, taking communion, as we're going to do a little bit later on, uh, one thing that always used to rub me up the wrong way was the fact that in traditional Anglican churches, the priests would receive the bread and wine first. And that just seemed rather impolite to me. It just seemed like it was saying priests are more important than the rest, Clergy are more important than laity, so we get served first. We go up first because we've got a dog collar on and a funny outfit. And then I heard why that was the case from Rowan Williams, the former Archbishop of Canterbury. And I thought, when Rowan speaks, I tend to listen to what he has to say. And, and he said, it's a recognition from the minister that they don't have anything to give themselves until they have first received. So they cannot even preside at the Eucharist and give out bread and wine to everyone else without having first received themselves. So actually, my experience, which felt like it was rude and just kind of put the priest on a pedestal, was actually a recognition that the, the minister is as dependent on God as everyone else and that actually the bread and the wine do not come from the priest, but from Jesus. And it is only when we recognize that our power, that we, we have nothing in our hands to give away unless we have received it first from God, that we can exercise the leadership that God has called us to. We can only give away what we have already been given. It is only when we know where the power for our ministry comes from that we can then pursue our purpose and our priorities. So before we are leaders, we are 
of followers. So just to wrap things up in this first talk of this, this series, we are all leaders, whether we realize that or not, or whether we like that or not, we all influence others one way or another. We are all apprentices. We are growing as disciples and as leaders. We can learn to lead better, and we hope this time together will help you. But thirdly, before all of those things, we are firstly followers. We must learn to lead like Jesus. And to do that, we need to receive from him. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to do something which says, Lord, I have nothing to offer you of myself. I can only receive what you first give. And we're going to share bread and wine together as we receive Jesus himself. So can I just ask you to stand? I'm just going to pray for us and then I'm going to hand over to Rick.